I am eager and excited uh, to welcome Sakivu Hutchinson. Um, uh, she's the author of Humanists in the Hood, Godless Americana, and Moral Combat, which was her first book, the first book on atheism, to be published by an African-American woman in 2011. In 2013, Sakiva was named Secular Woman of the Year. In 2015, she was awarded the Foundation Beyond Beliefs Humanist Innovator Award. And in 2016, the Secular Student Alliance gave her the Backbone Award. And in 2020, she was one of three honored with the Harvard Humanist of the Year. Those are all very impressive. Um, but I am especially impressed about the Backbone Award. As a woman of color, you need to have a good, strong one. And so with that, I welcome Sikivu. Good morning, and thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Well, I want to give a shout out of thanks and appreciation to the Brooklyn Ethical Society, to Vandra, to that great introduction that you just gave. And um, I am a former Brooklynite. I lived in Park Slope and Windsor Terrace for probably about eight, nine years back in the 90s. So I'm familiar with the terrain. And I'm going to begin by talking about what motivated me to write Humanists in the Hood. And I'm gonna start with a quote that begins the first page of the book by Alice Walker. And Alice Walker, of course, is a humanist and an activist and a visionary when it comes to challenging organized religion and lifting up black women's self-determination. And so she says, in my own work, I write not only what I want to read, understanding fully and indelibly that if I don't do it, no one else is so vitally interested or capable of doing it to my satisfaction. I write all the things I should have been able to read. And this is from her book, In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, from a chapter called Saving the Life That Is Your Own, The Importance of Models in the Artist's Life, circa 1976. And so to paraphrase Walker, I feel that Humanists in the Hood is the book that I should have been able to read and more specifically to see the lived experiences, social capital and cultural knowledge of my community reflected in humanist discourse, especially with regard to what it means to live in what I call the quote, stone cold here and now, that's the name of my first chapter of contemporary African-American communities at the intersection of American apartheid religious fundamentalism, and yes, apostasy. By way of background, in 2018, after seeing issue after issue of the Humanist Magazine, which many of you are familiar with, um, seeing all these issues with white folks on the cover, I approached the editor with the idea for a feature story on Black women humanists that would be modeled after my 2016 Huffington Post piece, 10 Fierce Atheists, unapologetically black women beyond belief. And that article featured 10 black women activists, educators, organizers, and writers uh, like Mendisa Thomas, the head of black non-believers, Bria Crutchfield, who was also an activist within black non-believers, Liz Ross, who is one of my colleagues in Black Skeptics Los Angeles, and Sharon Paget, who is an activist out of Atlanta. These are some of the women that were featured in that article about five years ago. And they've all been pioneering voices in atheist, humanist, and free thought organizing. They lead by example. They push back against sexist, heteronormative religious dogma and discrimination in communities of color. And they really brought a uniquely intersectional Black feminist vision to humanism while also challenging white supremacy and racist exclusion in historically Eurocentric atheist humanist and free thought circles. Nationwide, if we are to drill down and look at the demographics, black non-believers constitute less than 3% of atheists. Approximately 21% of African-Americans are religiously unaffiliated, but still identify notably with some form of God belief. 
And 66% of atheists are male and 34% are female, a noteworthy schism. Out of female atheists, Black women comprise 3% and Asian and Latinx comprise 7% of atheists, respectively. And so what is Black humanism? How is it relevant to contemporary African-American communities? And what are the implications of Black humanism in again, the stone cold here and now. So many of us know that atheism, of course, is at core non-belief in the existence of gods or supernatural supreme beings. But humanism is a worldview based on the idea that human beings determine morals, values, and ethics, not gods, not deities, not supernatural beings. African-American humanism in particular draws from antebellum traditions that privilege the revolutionary liberation struggle of free and enslaved Africans. And specifically African-American humanism emerges from resistance to European American notions of personhood and humanity based on white supremacist colonialist control over the body's labor and reproduction of people of color. Black feminist humanism recognizes that this history continues to shape the relationship between Black communities and the state, especially if we look at the impact of the regime of state violence on contemporary African-American communities, that these relationships continue to shape the dynamic between Black communities and faith institutions and Black women and rape culture, which derives in part from systematized sexual terrorism against Black women under slavery and European colonial occupation of indigenous lands and bodies. Black feminist humanism contemporarily emphasizes bodily autonomy and self-determination towards the disruption of respectability politics or norms emphasizing bourgeois conformity to gender binaries of masculine and feminine and sexuality. Black humanist feminist humanism emphasizes disrupting patriarchy and heteronormativity, as well as neoliberal or free market capitalism power structures that essentially maximize profit for the 1% and undermine the creation of multi-generational wealth in Black communities by predatory and subprime lending policies, land grabs slash gentrification, and of course, mass incarceration of Black youth and adults across sexuality age and disability. As Anthony Penn notes, quote, African-American humanism has an origin different from the Renaissance and the Enlightenment. Ideas from these may be present in African-American humanist thought, yet it is an indirect reference because African-American humanism draws its strength directly from African-American experience in the Americas and an appreciation of African-American cultural produ production and a perception of traditional forms of Black religiosity as having cultural importance as opposed to any type of cosmic authority. And that's in italicies to really underscore this syncretic relationship between Black secularists and African-Americans who are religious, who are faith-based, and the degree to which that is still a very powerful dynamic in our communities, even as we heretics challenge the regime and normative um, official propaganda, if you will, of religiosity. And so although there has long been this robust tradition of Black secular thought espoused by Black free thinkers like Richard Wright, Lorraine Hansberry, Langston Hughes, James Foreman, Hubert Harrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Anella Larson, the list goes on, the reductive association of atheism, humanism, and free thought with an agenda based almost exclusively on church state separation and science has effectively, in my view, stymied participation by people of color in secular movements. Moreover, white atheists and humanist co-signing of racist perceptions of African-Americans and people of color, as well as backlash against social justice organizing, which has been rife online, further underscore the racial divide that informs secularism. And the following quote from Liz Ross, who is a vegan and animal rights justice activist, as well as a colleague in Black Skeptics Los Angeles, 
really reflects many of the concerns that motivate people of color who identify openly with humanism and atheism. And she says, quote, I came to identify as an atheist after exploring the question of why there is so much senseless suffering and recognizing ways in which white supremacy, patriarchy, and anti-LGBTQ sentiment is embedded in religious doctrine and in our culture. The experience also played a pivotal role in liberating my mind from negative reflections of myself. The God that I was brought up to worship was not a reflection of myself, nor did the tenets of its holy book and the society in which I was raised offered me support to fully recognize my dignity as black, female, and not heterosexual. Recently, my focus has included both human and animal rights in our food system and working towards creating sustainable food systems. Our current food system implements policies and practices that work to maintain political and corporate power. Black Skeptics, the organization I founded in 2010, focuses on progressive secular social justice with an emphasis, again, on Black self-determination and Black social history and engaging youth in public education. And Liz's comments encapsulate why some Black folks reject organized religion and align with a radical progressive humanist belief system that is steeped in social change, not reliant upon God worship again and supernaturalism. Many secular people of color come to atheism and humanism as a rebuke of the contradictions that they see vis-a-vis -vis race, class, and gender-based social and economic disparities. They are troubled by the Epicurean question of why an all-powerful God or gods would sanction human suffering and inequality, especially in communities of color where religious belief and adherence are historically high. Black and Latinx women in particular criticize the moral policing and sexist slash misogynist prescriptions of Christian, Muslim, and other patriarchal religious traditions that tout binary structures of gender and sexuality. They decry the gender hierarchies within Black and Latinx churches that often confine women to subservient or support roles while denigrating female sexuality and bodily autonomy. And this, of course, is set against the backdrop that we've seen nationwide of Christian theocratic assaults on reproductive justice, birth control, abortion, and basic access to healthcare, as well as, of course, LGBTQI and queer rights. And this is also um, the backdrop that fuels major divides between white feminists and black feminists in movement organizing, especially when it comes to the rise of movements like Hashtag Me Too, which was spearheaded by an African-American feminist named Tarana Burke and the hashtag Say Her Name movement, which was spearheaded by African-American feminists, most notably Kimberly Crenshaw, the legal scholar and organizer. And we see these divides in public response to the lynching of scores of black women and girls like Ayanna Stanley Jones, murdered in 2010 in Detroit, a Tatiana Jefferson, murdered in 2019 in Kentucky, Sandra Bland murdered in 2016 in Texas and Breonna Taylor murdered as well in Kentucky, just to name a few. And we see it with the mass incarceration and sexual abuse to prison pipelining of black girls. And the fact that many of our blue collar essential workers are black women who are expected to care give everyone under the sun black children, black men, and white people while putting their lives on the line for their jobs. Many of us have seen the grim statistics that have emerged during the pandemic, where it's estimated that women of color have experienced the greatest losses in jobs, benefits, and workplace protections while being disproportionately forced to leave the workplace due to COVID and the lack of a solid and stable social safety welfare system. And this is where religious social welfare safety nets come in. Uh, as a black girl sexual violence survivor and SCI local 721 shop steward and parent of a non-binary child, my humanism has always been grounded in the here and now feminism of the everyday. Many of us grew up in and continue to live in, if we're talking about harmony and dissimilarity within communities of color. 
we continue to live in communities that are predominantly religious. We move through our communities as perpetual heathen outsiders, even as we work with and collaborate with faith-based faith -based folks. And we grew up seeing how destructive the Bible and Christian dogma were to Black women's self-determination, especially as an enforcer of this regime of endless caregiving, endless sacrifice, endless domestic violence, and putting Black men in patriarchy first at all cost. In the midst of hashtag Me Too, we see corrupt churches and predatory male faith leaders dominating our communities and sucking up investment dollars. And we can place this within the context, certainly, of the mega billions that the 1% have looted through the CARE Act, through tax loopholes, through bloated CEO salaries. And of course, the destruction of unionized workplaces that offer workers living wages with benefits, where increasingly defined benefit plans are relics of a bygone era. And this is one thing that has really become important if we look at the outcomes for Gen Z youth and millennial black youth, the ways in which they're being shut out of these historic protections and forms of social infrastructure. And there's a new article that just dropped on Bloomberg yesterday that talked about the rise of Gen Z entrepreneurialism and the so-called side hustle, where you have scores of young people who do not have solid living wage jobs with protections, who are forging these new enterprises online to make ends meet, to keep their heads above water. And so the last chapter in my book is called Gen Secular. And I unpack these shifting demographics in the 21st century. The fact that we have rising numbers of young folks that are identifying as religious nuns, as secular in some instances, uh, and that also are identifying as queer, trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming. And these young folks, as we know, are actively disrupting homophobia and transphobia on social media, in classrooms, and in communities. Some of them are at the forefront of racial and gender justice with Black Lives Matter, with anti-sexist and queer empowerment organizing, working to end child sexual abuse and discrimination against queer people of color who are more likely to be unemployed and at the poverty line. On page 115 of Humanist in the Hood, I write, quote, as greater numbers of millennial and Gen Z youth of color move away from organized religion and faith-based belief, the challenge for humanism in an increasingly divided economy will be even more pronounced. Many of these new generation nuns are looking for a worldview anchored in a secularist ethics that is explicitly anti-racist, explicitly anti-sexist and non-binary while having a clear perspective on the need to address economic inequality. Five years ago, when Black skeptics conducted a survey to gauge the issues that Black secular folks in our group were most interested in addressing, the top five were the school to prison pipeline, providing resources to LGBTQI plus youth, addressing racism and sexism in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics disciplines, providing prisoner reentry resources, and developing secular humanist educational curricula within K through 12 education. And these issues really speak directly to the realities and getting back to the recurring theme of being a humanist in the hood and the implications of that for praxis, which is the nexus between practice and theory. These speak to the realities of disenfranchised communities of color and again, underscore this divide between mainstream humanism slash atheism and the intersectional worldview espoused by secular humanists of color. So to break this down more concretely in terms of what we are doing here in South LA, over the past year, we have funded COVID pandemic relief grants to BIPOC secular folks and their families across religious affiliation, understanding that Folks who may identify as secular are not necessarily coming from secular immediate families and extended families. 
And this is for the purposes of rent, food, education, healthcare, and transportation assistance. Last year, the Women's Leadership Project Program, which is a Black feminist civic engagement and mentoring program that I founded in the early 2000s, spearheaded a community action to end rape culture and sexual violence during Domestic Violence Awareness Month in October. And this led to the formation of the Standing for Black Girls Task Force, which actually just convened and was youth led on Thursday. We also developed the Standing for Black Girls Wellness Initiative, which provides secular humanist, Black feminist, slash womanist, and LGBTQI counseling and therapy, recognizing that African-American girls have been disproportionately impacted by trauma during COVID, are disproportionately um, not gaining access to culturally competent mental health and welfare and wellness providers. Um, we're also spearheading a Black queer-focused youth camp pilot for the fall in partnership with Brave Trails LGBTQI plus camp. And in addition, Black Skeptics offers annual one-time as well as now multi-year scholarships for three categories of students, our WLP students who are high school graduates as well as college alum, foster unhoused LGBTQI and undocumented students as well as system-involved students and secular students. And our students have also been involved in youth coalitions that are focused on, again, redressing the disparities of the school to prison pipeline and implementing culturally responsive education, defunding school police, as well as the push out bill, which was sponsored by Massachusetts Congresswoman Ayanna Presley in 2019 and hopefully given the democratic majority in the Congress will pass this year or next year. And so I'm going to pause here and if I may share a few slides that encapsulate the work that we've been doing. Do I have the go ahead to share a screen? Yes, you should. Great. Okay, here we go. Okay, on the left is an event that we convened last fall called Voting While Black, Secular, and Gen Z. And this featured some of the young people that have received first in the family humanist scholarships and really talking about the implications of the then upcoming November election. And they're organizing on their campuses. On the right is a flyer from the Standing for Black Girls Community Action to End Rape Culture and Sexual Violence. And we were fortunate to have partners from all over the country supporting that effort, which again was spearheaded by African-American girls in collaboration with um, our Latinx youth allies. These are some images from that rally and I will probably play a brief clip from it. Okay, here it is. All right, let me see if I can pull this off here with the uh, audio. Violence, violence, and domestic violence. We can really, as a community, 
community in South LA go out in the streets to stand for black girls who have some of the highest rates of sexual violence, intimate partner violence, and domestic violence in the nation. Okay. All right. Can you hear me? Yes, we Great. can. Great. I'm just saying that because I had to switch from the different mics. Just wanted to ensure that you can hear me. All right. On the left, this is a flyer again, highlighting the disparities that African American girls experience when it comes to sexual violence and sexual harassment and not receiving intervention or care. To the right is just a, a flyer of our weekly Women's Leadership Project meeting where we're trying to highlight the nexus of Say Her Name and hashtag Me Too, and obviously uplift the brutal execution of Breonna Taylor. This is a 2016 article that I wrote about some of the recipients of our First in the Family Humanist Scholarship and the organizing work that they're doing. They're all, as you can see, of African descent. And these are some of the images from scholarship award ceremonies and engagements that we've had over the past seven years. And these are scholars from across the nation. And this is just a, an overview of, whoops. This is an overview of the Women's Leadership Project in our curriculum, which again has a humanist emphasis. These are two of our campuses, Gardena High School and Dorsey High School, which are all in South LA. And many of the youth that participate in our program go on to be the first in their families to go to college. Okay, um, to the left actually is a video I, I'm not gonna have time to show, but this was one of the forerunning sexual harassment prevention campaigns that we did in 2015, 2016, before hashtag Me Too burst on the national and global scene. And this is just a flyer from our annual Future Feminism Youth Conference, which is Youth Facilitated, Youth Spearheaded. And this is the first conference that we convened during COVID. All the prior conferences have obviously been in person. Uh, and this is the cover that I alluded to at the beginning of the talk, which some of you may be familiar with, um, that dropped in 2018 with the Five Fierce Humanists. And what was precipitated by, or rather the Humanist magazine occurred, and then that precipitated our formation of the Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference which was scuttled last year due to COVID, but is still on for 2021. If anyone is interested in that, uh, please drop me a line. And that's an encapsulation of some of the themes and speakers that were at that event in 2019 in Chicago. And then more scholarship winners. Okay, the book, audio book, which is out. And then as promised, Vandra and I talked about some giveaways for the forthcoming book, which comes out in a few weeks. And these are just some trivia questions that we can get into if there's time. Okay, so I'm going to pause here because I know that uh, you all have an agenda that you wanna pursue. And if there are any questions, we can take those. <laughs> 